City Light Church, so great to see each and every one of you here today. It truly is a blessing just to see so many people in these seats. I wasn't sure if it was going to be like this a little long while ago, but now we're back and we're in person, and I just feel like every week the presence is just getting stronger and stronger, right? Like worship this morning was just so amazing, so overwhelming. And the weight of the presence of the Holy Spirit sometimes, it, it can be too much. We were uh, meeting yesterday for the worship team and the worship meeting, and Pastor Doug shared a little bit. And he said something that, if it's your first time in the presence during worship, you should give it at least three times. Because sometimes the first time can seem a little weird, a little awkward, and then the next time maybe it's a little, a little more, and then, you know, you just got to give it that third time for breakthrough, right? And just to really sense the Holy Spirit. God left behind his Holy Spirit to be our helper, and it helps us enter into worship. And when we enter into worship, holding nothing back, truly that's when our lives can take form. God can get a hold of us, and he can bless us beyond these doors, beyond this place, right, in through eternity, and you can go out into the world, and you can just live in his power. And when we begin to do that, we are unstoppable. So we should just always press into the Lord, day in and day out. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for your, your presence, and I thank you for your spirit, God. I'd ask that you would be with me today as I share a word that you've given me, Father. I ask that anything that's not of you would just, just fall away right now, God, and that we could truly focus on the point you want to make here today. God, I pray that our hearts would be open, our ears would be open to hearing from you. God, we come here hungry. We come here thirsty. This is a time in our lives where we need you more than ever, Father. We need you, and we are willing to admit it, God. So today, may you answer that need and fill that need we have by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we're on this series, Rise Up. And I like the idea of, of rising up and getting up, because if we don't rise up, we just stay where we are. We don't make any progression. We don't move forward. And it reminds me of Jesus when he, when he rose up out of the grave, right, out of the tomb. I'm not going to focus so much on that today. It's coming up next week. But today I'm going to talk about building authentic relationship. Because it's important as a church that we reach out into the culture around us and that we, we are missionary-minded. But it's equally as important that we cultivate good relationships within this church. It is crucial to this body just operating on all cylinders. Let's review our vision and our mission statement here today. Our vision is, make, is uh, reaching people for Jesus one person at a time. And our mission is making biblical disciples through authentic relationships. I encourage everyone here to memorize these. Commit these to heart. This is the vision and the mission here at City Light Church. And if you're attending and you're part of our body and you're becoming a member, it's important that we kind of get track of the same vision and the same mission. That way we're all headed to the same point. We have the same future focus. And if we're all working together, it's going to be better for all of us. There's going to be less strife, less conflict, and we're going to be able to accomplish more if we're on the same page. Most importantly, we want to reach people for Jesus. What do you guys think is the tallest living thing on earth? Not man-made, but the tallest thing that God made. And the answer is the redwood cedar trees. And these are found in California, and these things are huge, let me tell you. Some of them can be 380 feet tall. These things are massive. And not only are they big, but they are old. Some are recorded as old as being 2,500 years old. That means these trees were around when Jesus walked the earth. Now just try to wrap your head around that for a second. And you would think being this large and being this old that they must have roots that go hundreds of feet into the ground, right? But the truth is, they have a very shallow root system. So what is it that keeps them from falling over? What is it that allows them to grow so tall and live for so long? The answer is the redwoods have a root system that is intertwined. It's like a mesh. And there's many redwood trees all surrounding each other, and their root system supports one another. And they keep standing. Or a single redwood tree would fall right over. But because there's many of them, and they work together, and they are actually intertwined, then they can remain and become the tallest living thing on earth. 
In the same way, if we're going to reach people, and we're going to reach new heights as a church, and if we're going to be all that God designed us to be, then we need to work together. I believe God has new heights for CLC to reach. I believe God has new heights for CLC to reach. Heights we haven't seen before. Heights that we can't even imagine, but God knows. And we're not going to reach those heights unless we begin to work together. Redwoods need each other, so do we. This is why God has given us the church. Right? God in this Bible describes the church as his body, the body of Jesus. And as followers of Christ, we belong to him, but we also belong to each other. We also rely on each other. Relationship. And that's what we're talking about here today. Our local church is our God-given support system. A support system is intended to meet some crucial needs in our lives. We all need support. We all need help. We can't do life alone. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 44. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. This is talking about the first church, the first group of people that gathered together to meet and to celebrate Jesus. It's very early on. These people sold everything they had, all their possessions, and they put it into the same pot. I can't even imagine doing that today, just taking everything we have and giving it to the same thing. Everything was shared. The reason the early church was so successful was because of their devotion to one another. These people were completely sold out to Jesus, and these people were completely sold out to one another as believers. They would regularly meet on a basis, regular basis for worship, for prayer, for Bible study, and for fellowship. They did life together. Acts 4.44 says all the believers were together. All of them. They didn't leave anybody out. Nobody got missed. Nobody was left behind. The power of the early church was their unity. The early church was persecuted. Early Christians were put to death, and they were just made to be tortured and, and just struggled for their beliefs. But the reason they persevered was because they weren't alone. They were doing it together. It wasn't easy to follow Christ in the first century. They had a lot going against them. But let me assure you, it is not easy to follow Jesus and truly live for him day in and day out in this century either. It's not easy. When you make a choice to follow Christ, many things rise up to take you down. Things like discouragement, temptation, and sin, apathy, materialism, unbelieving family members, unbelieving friends, doubts, rejection, and I could go on and on with things in the world that come against us as followers of Jesus. There are so many things out there that's trying to destroy our relationship with God. You know, it's described as a race that's to be won. We've got to continue to run. run. We've got to continue to fight for our lives. And I am so thankful that God didn't leave us to fight on our own. He gave us each other. And even just hearing that, and even knowing that, and even sensing that, just gives me some sort of relief. It gives me, you know, something to look forward to when I, I look around and I see people here, and I say, you know what? I'm not alone. We have each other. We're stronger together. As corny as that saying has become, it is so true. No man is an island. Pastor Doug says, a lone ranger is a stranger in danger. Right? It's so true. You are in danger if you are on your own. In order to persevere through the hard times, we need relationships. Relationships need to be built. Relationships need to be authentic. And relationships need to be for a lifetime. And saying that, I have way too few people that meet this criteria in my own life. And I don't think I'm alone in that. How many people here have at least three close friends they can speak to in a crisis? If something were to happen to you, if you lost your job, you lost all your money, maybe you lost somebody close to you, or you become ill, do you have people around you that could help you through that crisis? Our society is drifting further and further into a culture of disconnection with those around them. There was a study conducted in the early 90s that said 50% of people had at least three close friends they could talk to. In the last 10 years, that number shrunk to 20%. And with the isolation caused by COVID, that number is even smaller. 
There's very few people here today that have three close people that they can share anything with. What's causing this decline? You know, I, I've come up with a few factors that I believe is causing this decline. The first is marriage and family breakdown. It's no surprise that when a God-designed relationship like marriage has been attacked the way it has, that every single other relationship suffers. Right? The, marriage is kind of an example. It's an example of a relationship with God. It is designed to be for a lifetime. But we're losing that battle. Too few marriages last and go the distance. And the world looks at that and they see that and they kind of equate it to us as Christians, unfortunately, and they say, what relationship can stand the test of time? Does God really love me? Because if marriage is so weak, how can God be so strong? Lifelong relationships are so important. Another thing that gets in the way is the busyness of busyness. This can get in the way of relationships so easily because we get distracted. We live in a society that is task orientated, that is goal orientated. What has to get done? Check off the list. You know, there's an app for every single thing about things we have to get done in a day, and we're, we're rushing around and we're kind of running around like chickens with our head cut off, as the saying goes. We're really accomplishing nothing, but what's happening is we're doing life separately because of this. It's like, what do I have to get done? What do I need to get? Where do I need to go? We rarely are looking out for other people when we get wrapped up in the busyness of busyness. Another thing is people have also become more private. And this has become particularly true in the last couple years, I found. Nobody talks to their neighbor anymore. It is so easy in our culture and with technology right now to have everything outsourced. Our entertainment can be completely outsourced. We'd rather watch relationships on television shows than live them ourselves. Right? It started with the show Friends, and there's so many other shows like it where if I can watch other people live in their lives and having relationships, why would I do it myself? It's cheap, it's easy entertainment. Because you can go through all the motions, but you don't have to actually experience the hurt and the loss and the struggle. But those experiences is what makes a relationship real the perseverance and the struggle, and the good times are that much better than what you can feel simply watching them on television. I also blame you, Twitface. Oh, sorry, that's YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. For those not in the known, I'm not being mean. But social media, all together, has attacked relationships. That was funny, yeah. But... <laughs> So you can go on Facebook, and you can have all these followers, and you can call them your friends, your Facebook friends. You, I have thousands of friends on Facebook. Well, let me break it to you. You do not have thousands of friends on Facebook. You just think you have thousands of friends. You have thousands of people that you click on their pictures, and you follow them, and you kind of stalk them, which is a little weird. But that's what you're doing on Facebook. You're not developing real relationships if you never meet the person. They could be miles away. This is not relationship. And all the time spent in social media has made us completely unsocial. We no longer know how to talk to each other face to face. Having conversations feel awkward. We'd rather pull out our phone and say, wait a minute, let's just uh, Facebook message right now. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say. Or I'll get back to you later. And we click on these people and we touch them with our fingers and we think that's relationship. And you can throw Instagram and TikTok and a lot of other things in that same mold. It's so startling to me that more people aren't talking about this, that more people aren't taking a step back and noticing what's going on. I honestly believe Satan is using social media to isolate people. We are losing our ability to have actual conversations, to interact, because we have the ability to work online, we have the ability to have fun online, we have the ability to socialize online, and we can do this all without leaving our house. You can do church online too. You don't have to come in person. And I'm not saying these things are evil. And social media and, and Zoom calls, I know we've had too many of them, but they have their place. And these things can actually be used to spread the gospel. But relationship still needs to happen in person. Still needs to happen face to face. There still needs to be connection. Depression, it's running rampant. Right? People are more addicted to drugs than ever. The rise in overdoses, it's all been going on. 
It's all too common, and I'm seriously concerned about the next generation. Kids coming up today are struggling with things that I couldn't have even imagined as a child. Just because of where we are as a society and how technology has allowed us to not kind of be forced out of our comfort zones. I remember I had to, like, answer the phone. I remember I had to go to the store. Like, these are things we had to do. We had to develop these skills. Kids these days will not have to develop these skills. They can order whatever they want, have delivered to their front door, never talk to anyone, never meet anyone in person, and that is a scary thought. So what's the remedy for all this loneliness and insignificance in today's society? Well, I think the answer is the church. I really do. The greatest place to belong to is the church. The church is a place where we experience actual relationship. We experience depth and substance, and we build a biblical community. Right? At least that's how it should be. Unfortunately, isolation and loneliness isn't only found in our culture, but it can still be found in church. You can come to church week after week, not miss a Sunday, and you can still feel lonely. You can walk in these doors, you can celebrate, you can get good information, but you can still not experience life change through biblical community. You can be surrounded by people and still feel lonely. Randy Fries in his book, Making Room for Life, he says it's possible to be in the company of others and still feel isolated. Community specialists call this brand of isolation experienced by the majority of Americans as crowded loneliness. It's the most dangerous loneliness of all because it emits a false air of community that prevents us from diagnosing our dilemma correctly. We have exposure to lots of people, lots of valuable contact, but not a deep connection to people. And you know you've experienced this before. You can go to a sporting event, like a hockey game, and there's all these people there. But if you're there alone, you don't, you don't feel like connected. You don't have a relationship with people. Even though you're surrounded by people, you go to the mall, you're surrounded by people. You shouldn't be lonely, but you are. Because everyone's doing their own thing. They're like horses with blinders on. And unfortunately, sometimes you can come to church and you can still feel that way. You don't feel connected. You don't feel involved. And our desire here at City Light Church is that nobody would get left behind. We don't want to miss a connection. We don't want to miss a relationship. After the service today, we are having a time where if, it's, if you've been coming here you know, for seven months, eight months, if today's your first day, please come back and meet with the leaders and we just want to connect with you because we don't want people to get missed. A few hours on Sunday morning is not enough to build authentic relationships. It's not. And this is why building authentic relationships is played out through small groups. And that is why at City Light Church we push small groups as much as we do. Small group, get involved. Get involved. Small groups, they're the heart of the church. Just like the roots of the Redwoods get their strength from being connected, our church is strengthened through the authentic relationships created through small groups. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all our sins. Now, it's just one verse, and we can read through it quickly, and, and we get a sense that Jesus will cleanse us from our sins, and it's great. But we can't miss. If we walk in the light, as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And when I think of a small group, and I think of meeting in the light, to me that is no darkness. No room to hide anything. It's a safe place to be open and be honest about our shortcomings, not just talking about surface things, but getting so much deeper. You can have a closer relationship to someone after talking with them 10 minutes if you share your shortcomings, if you, if you share something than someone you've known for 30, 40 years that you just kind of have surface conversation with. It's so much more. When we get into a small group, it's more than just socializing. We're meeting with a purpose, a purpose to deepen our relationship with Christ collectively. Small groups are discipleship lived out. I'll give you another tree analogy here. So trees support one another. There's a Reader's Digest article I read. It says, what good is a tree? And it explained that when the roots of trees touch, there's this substance presence, and it reduces competition. In fact, this unknown fungus helps link roots of different trees of dissimilar species. A whole forest may be linked together. If one tree has access to water, another to nutrients, and a third to sunlight, the trees have the means to share everything 
with one another. This, this thing in nature is amazing because we can make it parallel relationships. We all have different strengths. We all have different weaknesses. Maybe you have something you can help me out with and I have something I can help you with. And when we get together in a group, we can help each other. And you know, just like that, that unknown fungus, I believe our relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit can act supernaturally in a way where we just know each other's needs. It's true. You know, we, we know who needs a helping hand. We know who needs to be talked to. And it's so supernatural and it's so amazing. I love when things mimic in nature in our lives. Being involved in Christian fellowship, it results in spiritual growth. This environment forces growth. It helps take the attention off yourself. Right? So much of society is, what do you want? You get into a small group, it's like, hey, how you doing? What do you need? This is how we mature as Christians. Small groups are environments in which people experience the most dramatic life transformation. I've seen it time and time again. When people get involved in a small group, all of a sudden their entire life starts to turn around. They start to have more success in the workplace. They start to have more success in their family. All of a sudden, they're, they're happier, and, and they can deal with things like depression and anxiety. Why? Because they're meeting with a group of people who are giving them what they need, those things they are lacking in their lives, and they're being built up every day. So often we think if we share our shortcomings with people, they're going to be like, laugh at us or something, or say, what are you doing? Get out of here. You're crazy. But that's never happened to me. All it does is deepen the relationship every single time. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. When two blades rub against each other, they both become sharper. And that's the same with us as people. When we kind of keep each other accountable and, and we can kind of be gritty sometimes with one another, but that's okay. It makes us better people. If we never rubbed up against anyone and, and no one ever tried to, to make us better, we would just have all these rough edges. We wouldn't be able to, to do what we can do in life and, and be propelled into what God has designed us to do without having those experiences with other people. It's not always easy. You know, sometimes people have told me things and put me in my place, and if you don't take it as constructive criticism, you, it can lead to bitterness and offense, but if you allow it to do its work in you, then it's just like it says here, iron will sharpen iron. A dull knife, it's still a knife, right? It's just not good for anything. It can't cut anything. And I don't want you guys to be dull Christians, right? You can still be a Christian and not be effective. It's true. We're saved by grace. You can say, hey, Jesus, come into my heart, and you're saved. But you can still be dull, and you can still not be effective if you're not getting into a relationship, and you're not being renewed every single day. The Word of God is a double-edged sword. It says that in Hebrews 4.12. It's with the Word that we are sharpened. It's with the word we can sharpen one another. If you come to someone in love and with scripture to help them out in a situation, even if it's to correct them, it's going to be good for them. It's going to be better. You can have a positive impact on their life. When storms of life come, we need to stand close together. We need to stand close with other Christians. You're going to have times in your life where you feel distance from God. I guarantee it. And these times, it's the people in your small group who you can hold on to. They're like your safety net. The body of Christ, this church is, is real and tangible, and your relationship with God, when it's shared with people around you, it becomes real. It becomes tangible because you can see God in action in their lives. They share their stories with you. It's not so abstract anymore. You can sense it. You can know it. What is a friend? A friend is not somebody that you like on Facebook. A friend is not simply an acquaintance. Right? There are steps to be taken to build real, authentic relationships or relationships. That was corny. So three keys to building real friendships. Number one, honesty and authenticity. We got to be real. People have to know us for our true selves. There's a story of a woman in a hospital who had a near-death experience while on an operating table. And she sees God, and she says, Is it my time to die? But God says, No, I assure you, you have 40 years, 6 months, and 21 days to live. So she remembers God's revelation to her after coming out of the anesthetic. And she decides, with her newfound longevity, she's going to make some changes. She goes through a series of cosmetic surgeries. She gets the works. 
liposuction, a facelift, the tummy tuck. She even has professionals come to change her eye color and her hair color, and she has a designer and an entire new wardrobe, and she's all dressed up, and she leaves that hospital looking like a million bucks. She is dressed to the nines, and she's walking out. She catches a glimpse of herself and a reflection. She's like, man, I look good. But she's not paying attention. She steps into the road, and she's smacked by a bus, and she dies. She gets to heaven, and God is there, and she says, God, what happened? You said I had over 40 years to live. And God said, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Sometimes we got to be real. We got to be authentic or else people won't recognize you. Right? We live in a society where we purposely put our best foot forward. We make up online profiles on Facebook that only show the best you. Right? It's not being honest if you're just showing the good times in your lives. Look what we did on this family vacation. Everyone was there. Everyone was happy. Or look what I cooked today. It was delicious, and the kids loved it. You don't see the mess behind the scenes. You don't see the real, right? There's something missing in these posts. Every time I look at them, I'm like, no, I have five kids, and I know what it's like at home some days. It's, it doesn't look like that. And I guarantee you it doesn't look like that to them either, but they're choosing to put that foot forward. Just like that woman who had all those changes to look better on the outside. Let me in, I'll let you in on a little secret that uh, nobody has it all put together. You know that? I don't have it all put together. Pastor Doug and Karen don't have it all put together. Shocker. <laughs> but it's true. We don't have it all put together. We need to be honest with ourselves. And we need to be honest with each other. Henry Nguyen, uh, he points out that if we are unified by our common weaknesses... We are unified by our common weaknesses, our common failures, our common disappointments, and our common inconsistencies. This is amazing to us, because you think about unity and striving for unity and to create unity, but what really unifies us is our mess. What really brings us together is where we fall short, where we don't quite add up. I think that's why Jesus was always hanging out with the broken, the poor, and the sick, because he knew they were real. He didn't want to hang out with people that were fake and pretended like they had it all together. He said, don't pray like the Pharisees who say, you know, I, I, I'm so good and holy and there's nothing wrong with me. No, pray like the tax collector who says, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He is looking for people who are willing to share their weaknesses. It's so when we share our weaknesses with one another that we are unified. Nothing brings people together like their shortcomings. And it's essential and building real friendships. You need people in your life you can share everything with. Jesus, he was real. He felt pain and agony. Sometimes we think like Jesus is supernatural, but he was fully human. He had struggles. Not everything came easy for Jesus. He was born to die, and he knew he was going to die, and he knew the time, and it, it kept getting closer and closer, and, and as it draw near, Jesus struggled. He struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was questioning if he could even go through with it. He was very troubled, and, and he shared with his disciples at that time. He shared with the people that were closest to him, with relationships. Even Jesus couldn't do it on his own, right? He chose 12 guys to do life with, and that's what he did. And he said in Matthew 26, 38 to them, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Does this sound like a guy who is feeling good? His mood is high? No. He is sharing with them his pain and his struggle. Jesus never pretended to be something he wasn't, never dishonest with who he was, even when his, he was in his deepest despairs. And, and we need to be open and honest like that too. When we have hurts and we have hard times, we need to share it with each other. James chapter 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. And I believe that if you want to be healed from what's bugging you and what's messing with you, you need to confess it. Number two, what makes good friendship? is consistency. consistency. Proverbs, Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times, not sometimes, not, not when they feel like it, it not when maybe the friend is treating you like a friend, but all times. You don't love people when it's convenient. One reason many of us often feel lonely is because in the friendships we do have, there is no consistency. If you're not consistently there, then you don't consistently care. Some friends are not truly friends at all, I read a story of this man named Donald DeGreve. He died at the age of 65 while playing golf. 
he has a heart attack and he drops dead on the 16th hole and the, they were trying to contact his wife in the funeral home but the three guys that were playing with Donnie while his body lay there with a the sheet covering it they go on to play the 17th hole and then the 18th hole just to finish the round of golf one of these men said life goes on so we just had to keep playing and I'm thinking to myself, how deep are these friendships? Your friend literally just died right in front of you, and you get, well, there's a game to play. We've got to finish this golf game. Do you want to be surrounded by people like that, where they just want you to fill a slot, a placeholder? A friend loves at all times. When we are not consistently caring for one another, we become unable to assess what's occurring in the lives of other people around us. The church is described as a body. We should be aware of all its members and that's why prayer needs, they should be shared with every single person. And I feel like over the last couple of years in COVID, there's just been this stigma of not wanting to share when we're sick, not want to share when we're hurting. And I've seen it time and time again. I've been on the out so many times. And it's like, I just want to pray for you. I just want to help you. And I think it is so important that we're open and we're honest and we just get over ourselves. Nobody cares, okay? They don't care if you have COVID. They don't care if it's something else. Just share your needs. Pray for one another. Come together as a church. That is what's going to build true, authentic relationship. When one of our members suffers here, we all suffer together. That's what's part of being a body, right? Just because your finger's hurting, you still feel it in your mind and everywhere else, and it affects the entire body. It affects how good you can go out and do things, right? And if someone has success too, we've got to be sharing that. We have good times to celebrate. Share it with people around you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 24 says, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That's the church I see here today. Right? A church where we can share in our struggles and share in our triumphs and just do life together. I have a question. Why do you think people make bad decisions? The answer is because they're making these decisions on their own. This is another place where relationships can just help us out so much. If you go to people and you ask their advice and you say, hey, this is what I'm going through, what do you think? You're going to make a better decision. If you're just trying to do everything on your own, you're going to keep falling over and over again. You've got to make sure you're going to the right places for the advice. True friends, true friends are there for advice and they actually care about your well-being. The third key to making real friends, this last one here, mutual encouragement and support. You need encouragement, you need support, but it needs to be mutual. It's a two-way street. You know, there's a baseball player, his name was Jackie Robinson. He's best known for being the first African-American to play Major League Baseball during the 1950s. I still can't believe it. It's like, wasn't really that long ago. And while ba breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced the boos and the insults of crowds in every single stadium. Not because he was a bad player, but because the color of his skin. And one day while he was playing in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he committed an error, which every other player does, but the fans began to boo him. The fans began to ridicule him. And he stood there, totally humiliated. And that's when uh, shortstop Pee Wee Reese, he called for a timeout, his teammate. And he walked toward Robertson and he stood next to him. And this teammate from the South, who was the last person that would have been expected to pay Robinson any notice, what did he do? He put his arm around Jackie Robinson. And as soon as he did that, the fans grew quiet. They stopped ridiculing because they saw the support and they saw that moment for what it was. It was so much greater than hate and anger. Love always wins. Acceptance always wins every single time. Later, Jackie Robinson said that that shoulder or that arm around his shoulder, it saved his career. The story of Robinson is what true friends do. A true friend is there in your time and need and also Friends come in all different shapes and sizes, and sometimes your best friends are the people you least expect. Don't count anyone short.
The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Encourage one another, build each other up. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Each of you should not look to your own, only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him out. It always reminds me of Mr. T. I pity the fool who has nobody. And like 25% of people here are like, what are you talking about? But some people got it. But it's true. Like, I do pity the person who has nobody to help them out. Nobody to lend them a helping hand. There is so much more strength when we are together. And there are so many more verses in the Bible about relationship. Time and time again, God is in relationship with us. God is in relationship with His Son and with the Holy Spirit, three in one. And we're said to be one as Him and the Father are one. So just like you think about that, God, we, we know this, right? Three in one. And it's this divine oneness. And we're called to have that same oneness. And it's impossible without the Spirit, without that special factor to bring us together. But we are part of a body, and we depend on one another. We need to be nice to each other. We need to love one another, just as Christ loved the church. You wouldn't cut off your own arm. It's nice to have. You need it. And as absurd as that sounds, why do you cut out members of this congregation? Why do you say certain people, you know, you just, you just turn a blind eye to you and say, I'm not going to talk to them anymore because you're offended. You're part of the same body. It's your family. The only difference is this is the family we choose. And this is the family that God has chosen for you to be a part of. So whatever it is, I encourage you, just get over it. Mend those relationships. It requires us being humble. Letting go of the me first attitude. Building relationships with those around you. As a church, we can go so much further together than we can on our own. Right? No one person is a church. Every single person here is part of this church. Every single person here should be volunteering, should be offering something, because we're all part of the body, and we all have a place and a purpose. You need to humble yourselves. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. This is the last verse I'm going to share with you guys. It says, Don't be selfish. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus is the example of true humbleness. Okay, like he chose, God came and, and was born in a manger, surrounded by dirty animals, filthy, poor. And then when he dies, he dies as a criminal, accused. He's just made to suffer. That's like true humbleness. Anytime he could have just got off that cross and walked away, but we wouldn't have been saved. So we need to, like, take that example. True love is shown through humility. A true friend will sacrifice his own well-being to help someone out. It says that in John 15, 13. Greater love no one has than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Building authentic relationships is going to bring this church closer together. And this support system will allow us to reach the greatest heights. Just like those redwood trees in California that can grow up towards the heavens, if we stick together and we work together, and we do life together, then we are going to reach new heights for Jesus. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your words of encouragement and support, God. Today, I just lift up every single heart, every single soul, every single mind that is here. God, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you may begin to intertwine our lives. You may begin to show us the importance of relationship, the importance of authentic relationship. God, I ask that you would take away all our pride. God, take away 
the image that we've built up in front of ourselves to hide our true selves, God. I ask that you would begin to break down those walls right now for each and every person here, God. I pray that in even the little bit of openness that we've offered, that we could be even so much more open. God, I pray here at City Light Church that we would be knitted together and intertwined by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, so that you can build these relationships where we're here for one another, we love one another, where we feel your presence every single day. Not just on a Sunday morning, God, but during the week. If we need anything, if we're suffering, that we have someone to turn to. God, I thank you so much that you gave your son to die for us. The ultimate sacrifice, you chose to come. Humble yourself, Father. If we want to experience real, authentic relationship, it can only be done as followers of you. If you're here today and you haven't made that decision to follow Jesus, if you haven't really made that decision to follow Jesus, if you haven't really decided to be completely sold out to him, I want to lead you in a prayer. You, you can say it in your mind. You can say it out loud. It's up to you. But just say these words after me. If you want to start today to be in an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, you say, Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I know only you can take away the sin in my life. I ask you to come live inside of me. I choose to follow you with everything I have. I make you Lord and King over my life. Amen. If you guys need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for your family members, if you need prayer just to feel better, to get over some anxiety, if you need prayer to go out into a new venture in your life and you're afraid to do that, maybe you're afraid to step out, then come up here. Get prayer. We have amazing prayer warriors here that will pray for you and they can release you into where God wants you.